All right, let's get started. So first off, thank you everyone for joining us today. Welcome to another wonderful session of CRISPR Office Hours that we host weekly to help the genome engineering community navigate these unique challenges and exciting times. A uh, reminder for housekeeping, we're going to be recording all these videos and they are hosted on YouTube. And you can actually look at past CRISPR Office Hour videos on our YouTube channel. So whenever you have some time, take a look. And if you wanna catch up, send them, uh, go to YouTube and you can find the office hours. So as we've said before, and we wanna always reiterate, our goal with CRISPR office hours is to help the scientific community have a venue where they can interact with one another, ask questions, and tackle the challenges that lie ahead for us together. As being a community always helps ensure we have the support of one another, and sometimes the questions that we ask, the answers are found outside of where we think we'll find them. So as we traverse through this COVID-19 pandemic, we've had so far five CRISPR office hours, and we'll be doing a few more coming up. But what we really want to say is to get the most out of these office hours, interact as much as possible, send in questions through the chat window. That is what we've seen give value to everyone that's attending, as well as folks that are on the panel as well. So with that, let me kick it off and introduce myself. My name is Aditya Vempati, and I'm the VP of Marketing at Synthigo. And as always, it's a pleasure hosting with my co-host, Kevin Holden. Say hi, Kevin. Hey, Aditya. Hey, everybody. And uh, welcome to uh, Season 1, Episode 5 of CRISPR Office Hours. Uh, I'm your co-host, Kevin Holden, uh, Head of Science at Synthigo. And uh, the title for our Office Hours episode this week is Critical Research Considerations During the COVID-19 Pandemic. All right, so uh, as we mentioned a few times over the past several weeks, now has never been a better time to keep calm and carry on. So uh, this was originally a poster produced by the British government during World War II as part of a public assurance campaign to remind people that even in the face of danger, it's important not to be paralyzed by fear, uh, but to stay collected and to get, on with need, to get on with what needs to be done. So we think this slogan has never been more appropriate than now, and uh, as we all do our part to try to fight the COVID-19 pandemic. And from all of us at Synthigo, we'd like to remind you, our genome engineers and our audience, um, to keep calm and CRISPR on. So today we're going to hear about uh, some truly um, brilliant scientist who is working um, uh, to cope during the situation uh, that we're all going through. So we want to just let everyone know, everyone on the, that is on the office hours at the end, we'll give you guys information on how to collect this shirt. So stay on throughout. We hope you have a really engaging session um, with our guest panelist, Laura Lambert. And yeah, we're really excited to continue on with these office hours. And with that, I wanna introduce the panel. Obviously, uh, Kevin Holden, my co-host, and our guest today, uh, Laura Lambert. And hey, she, everyone. hello, Laura. And a little bit about Laura, she is a assistant professor at the University of Alabama and Brigham, and also serves as a co-director of the transgenic and genetically engineered mouse cores there. Go ahead, Laura. Hey everyone, thank you to Synthigo for having me on today. Cool, so Laura, as, um, just to give you a little background, we always have a poll question um, that we start off with. And me and Kevin and um, some of the folks like Bobby, you'll see him answering questions. We come up with witty ones where we think it will be engaging for folks. So everyone online, uh, we've got a question for you guys. What are you currently binge watching? And use chat to uh, put your options in. The first one is uh, Pentagon Alien Videos on YouTube. Tiger King, Ozark, 90 Day Fiance. I'm not gonna lie, I binge watch that all the time with my fiance. And Parks and Rec, The Office, a rerun, and watching it again. Or CRISPR Office Hour reruns on YouTube. Uh, please use the chat and send in your options. Uh, we'll keep this here for a few, uh, few seconds. So Kevin, what are you binge watching? Um, I think honestly, definitely those um, videos of uh, unidentified flying objects that the Pentagon said were real on YouTube. I don't know if you yeah. saw any of those. One of them actually looks like a TIE fighter. Wow. Kind of interesting. Yeah. 
but uh, yeah, that definitely got my attention this week. <laughs> oh, what about yourself, Laura? Um, so I'm a little bit behind, but I just started watching Tiger King, so no one spoil it for me. But <laughs> I just started episode two. I'm just, I think, at the beginning of the roller coaster. Oh man, yeah. For me, as I said, it was it's it's 90 Day Fiance. I didn't realize I'd be actually liking a show about that, but it's it's quite entertaining. So we have, wow, quite a few options. People are definitely watching Netflix. We got everything from uh, number three, Ozark, to number six, The Office again, to Silicon Valley, uh, K-dramas. I'm not sure what that is. But then we also have someone who said, sorry, none of the above, Homeland season eight. And then obviously a great one, Star Trek Discovery and Picard. So thanks for all the feedback. Definitely folks enjoy watching their uh, TV. So with that, thank you for all that. And I'm going to open it up to a model that we've been talking uh, for a few weeks. And I want to take a moment, let Kevin reorient us on this right here. Yeah, sure thing. So for uh, the past few weeks, we've been discussing uh, this model um, that was developed by the Linus Group, which uh, surveyed over 2,000 scientists about their thoughts and activities during the pandemic. So we're probably all still persisting in this section we called the golden interim phase, but maybe now we're starting to move into the transition as uh, in some areas, the uh, shelter in place, the, the shutdown is, we're starting to come out of that in, in some regions as we flatten the curve um, in, in different um, locations. So um, last week we heard from two scientists at MIT about how they're coping uh, during this time and some of the COVID-19 research they've collaborated on. And today we bring in a scientist uh, who's not only concerned with her own research um, that she's doing during this time, but also um, how she can actually continue to try to run a major transgenic core facility. So Laura's going to tell us a little bit about how her lab and the core are coping uh, during this current situation. Yeah. Okay, Laura. So yeah, thanks again so much for being on the show today. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you would normally be doing in your lab right now and at the transgenic core? Yeah, definitely. So um, right now we would be uh, doing a minimum of three days of microinjection a week, producing models for both UAB and um, uh, investigators external to UAB via a private foundation or even some families that we work with. Um, and we'd be doing multiple sperm cryopreservations and IVFs as well. So you can imagine we're getting a little bit backlogged right now. Um, yeah, I think if we can just move on, there you go. Okay, so um, tell us a little bit about what you uh, normally do and what your, your uh, is, as part of your role as the, um, the co-director at the Transgenic Corps. Yeah, so um, we're primarily producing mouse models. We produce rat models as well. Um, we're one of few facilities that's offering that currently. Um, we also do some cell editing, whether that is in iPSCs or stem cells, but the bulk of the work that we do and what makes up most of my week is doing pronuclear microinjection. So since we've been able to introduce CRISPR-Cas9 into our workflow, um, we, we've integrated it into almost every aspect of what we're doing now. So the majority of our project requests in the last year to two year, uh, two years are patient mutations. So whether those are SNPs or um, insertions and deletions or splicing mutants, uh, we're able to make those designer alleles. We also are producing conditional alleles using CRISPR now through pronuclear microinjection. So that kind of gets us around having to go through the embryonic stem cells and producing chimeras. And we can produce, you know, our classic transgenics as well using simple transgenes and uh, making reporters or overexpression models. Um, you can see at the bottom down there, that's just a little video of uh, microinjection in our facility. And um, those are actually rat pups where one of them is affected with cystic fibrosis. So we, um, we made a mutation um, in CFTR and we're able to see some of the uh, CF phenotypes down there. We do still have the ability, of course, to do ESL microinjection. We just have fewer and fewer projects now. And CRISPR is actually 
um, being integrated into that as well. So we're doing our targeting in the ES ESLs with CRISPR before doing the ESL injections. And I would say right now, the uh, definitely the bulk of the project requests that we're getting are for our cryopreservation services. And that's going hand in hand with our assisted reproductive techniques. So that's our in vitro fertilization, um, re-derivations of, um, so that'd be like transplanting the frozen thawed embryos from various vendors and um, resources and um, absolutely uh, germplasm cryopreservation. So we're doing sperm cryopreservation um, as well as freezing down embryos and um, there's a surge of investigators realizing that they don't have their animal models properly cryopreserved for an event like this. So um, definitely inundated with those requests now. And then I'll say we, we do some specialty microinjection services. So um, we do some mitochondrial nuclear exchange and we, we can do that with mice. We've also done a little bit with pig embryos. So really anything microinjection based or um, cryopreservation based is kind of in our wheelhouse. So, so just from like a high level, how, how have things changed for you during this time, the, doing that you run all these services? Yeah, um, life has changed so much. We left on a Friday kind of understanding that the pandemic was coming this way. Alabama was one of the last states to get a positive uh, confirmed case, most likely due to a lack of testing more than anything. Um, but we um, we all left for the day, and then we had we got an email saying, "Don't uh, wrap up what you're doing by Monday, and then um, no one can come in to do any work for two weeks." Um, we also received an email that caused a little bit of a panic from our um, animal resource facility that we needed to tag 25% of our cages maximum um, as priority and in the event that our food supply chain was disrupted the remaining animals would be euthanized so that caused quite a stir on campus of um, people you know wondering if they could take their animals home with them instead of having them euthanized or if they could try to um, find some food and bring it in for them um, the answer to which was a resounding no that's not allowed um, so then, you know, people came to us to say, can you freeze them down? But yeah, um, things are just so different now because we can't, we can't get on campus. That's, that's a great point, Laura. So we, you know, we've, we've been talking to a lot of scientists, um, on the show, um, who have been working in more of a traditional cell culture lab. So how, how does running, um, a core during this time really differ from working in a cell culture lab and who's, who's helping to coordinate? that the welfare of the animals yeah um you know not to say that you know every every one of us is facing unique challenges right now i would say that animal intensive labs are going through our own unique challenges where you know we don't have the ability to just freeze down an experimental cohort and bring it back later, you know, we would have to completely rederive the line. So some of our colleagues have um, more flexibility where they're able to maybe just bank down their cells, wrap up their experiments and more easily pick them up in the future. Um, we're looking at, you know, how to use aggressive breeding schemes and um, try not to get too far behind on our um, animal experiment endpoints and then also being concerned about a second wave coming and if we're going to have to go through this again as soon as we get our animals back you know our populations back up so can you um maybe uh on on the next slide maybe you can talk us a little bit more through about um how you actually typically go through um your uh, your work procedures for doing CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing and, and maybe how this is being affected right now. So um, I can see you're, you're talking here about doing model design. Are you doing more of that now, design work? Absolutely. So like you showed in the diagram, we're in that golden interim. People are doing a lot of experiment planning, grant writing, and they're um, 
thinking of new models that they'd like to have. So we're getting a lot of design requests. And I think that's probably the most valuable thing that I can do for my uh, facility right now is to continue on doing the CRISPR model design, repair template design. And, you know, fortunately, we're still able to, to receive our guides. So um, we are using Synthago's guides to produce our animals and we're still able to get those in hand. So when we get back, we're not too um, far behind. They're, the, the reagents are there waiting for us. We just can't use them right now. And so I guess maybe um, do, you, yeah, if you think about the, the model creation, you just obviously you're not able to do any of this pro-nuclear injection right now. No, and that, that's what's probably our biggest challenge right now is our, our animals are there, um, but we're just not able to use them. We're just kind of in maintenance mode right now, um, keeping a minimal amount of breeders and trying to minimize the amount of time that um, our employees are having to go into the lab and take care of them. What, what does that kind of look like in terms of, um, do you have uh, specific people that will still need to come in and, and do take care of animal welfare and then just, I guess, wear more PPE than normal? Yeah, um, we are, so we have a fantastic research staff that works in the core and everyone's been really great about coordinating going in and out of the lab. So we have um, two researchers that are primarily in charge of animal welfare. You know, these animals are still developing tumors. They're still getting dermatitis, any number of issues. And, um, you know, we, we have our unique lines that, you know, we're trying to build up for experiments too. So um, we're definitely thankful to have employees that are using their PPE and going into the lab and taking care of uh, critical animals. So, um, Laura, you, you mentioned, um, we talked a little bit about the golden interim phase and, you know, now doing this design work while you can't be um, in the lab in the core doing these micro injections. Um, wh what else have you been working on, um, like just at home, um, in terms of what other work types of work can you do during this time? Yeah, I think the ideal would be uh, manuscript writing right now, of course, you know, so manuscript writing and grant planning. Um, I have a three-year-old son and a nine-month-old daughter who, you know, we don't have access to daycare right now. So I am trying to work full-time and be a mom full-time. And uh, my husband is actually in medical school. And, you know, for those of you familiar with that process, he's, um, preparing to take his step one exam, which is, uh, requires him to also study full time. So we're all trying to balance our different needs. And um, it's definitely hard to focus. It's hard to get into kind of a, a writing state of mind. It's easy for me to do things like CRISPR design, um, you know, emailing with the PIs and, and, and that, that type of work. But when it comes to actually sitting down looking at a blank page and writing a manuscript that's been so challenging. <laughs> I bet, yeah. I was muted. I'm sure as you're going through this, many people are wondering, when do you anticipate coming back into the lab? And what do you think that looks like when you get back in terms of projects and backlogs and loads? Yeah. Of things you'd come to do? It's so stressful to think about, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's, um, it's going to be a challenge right now. They're not telling us a date that we're coming back. As far as the state of Alabama, our governor has said that we can um, start kind of loosening up a little bit as of this Friday until May 15th. Um, I'm hearing whispers that will be out through May, but kind of hearing that maybe we'll be able to come in earlier than that. One of the significant, significant challenges that we're facing is, um, you know, we're being asked to create new SOPs as far as um, personal safety and PPE. And um, one of the suggestions is to consider shift work. But, you know, those of you in the audience who work with animals can appreciate how difficult that is to try to do um, with rodents, they're on a specific schedule, you know, you can't disrupt their circadian rhythm, it'll affect your experiments. So we are, we don't have as much flexibility as, you know, we don't have a, a, a third shift option so that we can avoid each other. So um, we're really 
at this point, we're still trying to figure out exactly what's going to work best for us. And I don't think we're going to know that until, until we are, you know, starting to reopen. Um, it's, it's definitely going to be a challenge as far as the backlog, you know, we're able to really quickly process things like sperm cryopreservation. That's, that's no problem. And, you know, to anyone out there in the audience that's thinking about trying it, it really is a very straightforward procedure. Um, and, you know, I'm happy to, to talk with you about it, you know, talk, um, point you in the right direction as far as protocols, if it's something that you want to try. So that, that's not the issue. For us, the issue is going to be model production. So we, we had our projects that were ready to inject um, before we left, that they were on the schedule and they, um, you, you know, we weren't able to get that done. We have projects that we had ordered reagents. Now we have all the reagents and we're still taking in projects. So we're, we're just amassing, um, the biggest concern right now is just amassing that backlog and how we're going to be able to work through it. Okay. That definitely sounds like there's going to be a few challenges that you'll have to tackle. How are your coworkers dealing with the situation? What are, you know, we want to be empathetic and talk about the community. What are some things you're seeing them um, go through? Yeah, absolutely. Everyone has been really um, understanding and flexible as far as our group goes. We set up a, a calendar online so we can sign up for you know the hours that we think we'll be there in person so we can try to avoid each other. Um, sharing PPE, Bob has offered to um, install plexiglass shields like between the bays so that we can be a little more spaced out from each other. So um, some of us um, our, like our lab manager drove one of our undergraduates to get groceries because he doesn't have a car. Oh, sorry, graduate student. Um, so, you know, all, we're all trying to help each other out. Um, one of our researchers was actually at the end of her maternity leave when the pandemic happened. So she was supposed to come back April 1st and she just amazingly jumped right back in, um, going into the lab, doing all of that, even with her, you know, three to four month old at home. So there are, there are different pressures though. You know, some of our researchers um, are kind of feeling pressure to still be in the lab producing data, even though, you know, the university's made it clear that you can halt anything that's not COVID related right now, but, you know, everyone, is worried about their job and, you know, having job security and, you know, maintaining their salary and, and being productive. So there, there's just, it's a lot of push and pull. Yeah, I know, I know, especially um, since, you know, now a lot of places are coming out of the shelter in place. Um, maybe some would argue too early. Um, and, you know, I think we're seeing a lot of push and pull on that as well, especially in different parts of um, the U S and also in, in other countries. Um, what, Laura, what happens do you think if, if there's a second wave, like if, if you're able to come back and get things started and then, then we have to shut down again? Yeah, uh, I think that is, you know, like you said, that's on everyone's mind. So my son, he, he will be four in July and he starts pre-K this fall. If they go to distance learning, you know, I am not equipped to be a preschool teacher, by any means, like I can teach graduate level genetics and genomics, no problem. I don't know how to teach that while also working full time. And my husband is going to be, you know, in a COVID clinic somewhere. I, I, like, I don't even, it, it's hard to think about. Um, and as far as, as our experiments go, uh, it's just going to be so difficult to ramp down and then ramp back up again. But, you know, you, you just got to keep going and, and try to manage the best you can. It's, it's definitely a concern right now. Yeah, it's all really great points. And, you know, hopefully, you know, it, that doesn't happen. And, um, you know, we're able to resume life as, as, as normal. Um, I guess the, the other thing, speaking of that, besides this work you do uh, in the transgenic core, these projects that you're working on for, for other scientists, um, can you tell us a little bit about your, your own research, what you, what you typically research, and, and kind of what you'd have to put on hold during this time as well? Yeah, definitely. So at UAB, we have a really robust neurofibromatosis type 1 
research group. We are led by Dr. Bruce Korf that we have the pleasure of working with. And UAB, you know, we have multiple different research groups, but we also serve as a uh, clinical trials coordinator where we act as a repository for not only the mice that we generate, but also cell lines, um, ESLs, things like that. So um, I like to look at NF1 from a um, genetically engineered models point of view. That at, at my in my heart, I'm a model maker. That's that's um, how my brain works. And so when I think about NF, it's really tricky and interesting and and exciting for me because it's it's very large. So it's 57 exons. There are thousands of different mutations. There's no um, one common mutation like maybe if you think of uh, cystic fibrosis, something like that. Um, they're all very uh, there, there, there are no hot spots within the gene, and the as far as the um, phenotype itself goes with the mice, it's very variable. So um, you can have you know dermal tumors, you can have optic glioma, um, any any number of different phenotypes, um, and so you can see in the table there just how many different patient specific mutations that we've made in the mice, and the bottom two listed there are in rats. So we're making um, insertions, deletions, splicing mutants. Um, we have a conditional allele. We've deleted entire exons. Um, we're and and it's exciting because we're able to do things. Um, just for example, like the um, exon five mutant, we weren't able to use Cas9 for that one, so it was a good opportunity to try out using CPF1 and making an animal model that way. So it kind of keeps me on my toes and trying to keep up with the latest um, improvements in the field so that we can get these animals produced. So, and then during this time, I, I'm guessing, you know, you, you're, you've got uh, projects that you've, you're working on for other people and then also uh, your own projects here for this research. And is all of that just kind of being put on hold and is your, is your boss like okay with that? <laughs> <laughs> so as much as it can be, right? So. Um, this slide showing what I consider my pet project. So I love working with the rats and um, we took a mutation in NF1 that in humans is associated with bilateral spinal cord tumors. And um, we, um, we put that into the rat. So we just made that patient specific mutation. We ended up with that model as well as a 14 base pair deletion model. And then you can see kind of in, in this figure panel here, um, first of all, the aggressive mammary adenocarcinoma that develops, but also what we were interested in is the divergence between um, what we refer to as the knock in allele versus the knock out allele. And, um, you can see just how rapidly these tumors are developing and the divergence in the phenotype there. I uh, just want to highlight this pet image over to the side here. That large um, red mass is actually a mammary tumor. And um, you can see above that, those two bright red spots are what we think are metastases to the kidneys. We're also seeing what looks like spinal cord tumors, which is so exciting for us when we're able to see things that we think are, um, are uh, capturing what's actually going on in the human. So um, we took a look at that through EM and it does look like we're seeing um, the disheveled nerve bundles and um, we're taking a closer look at that. But we have a lot of data that we're waiting to come back to us right now so we can get this manuscript out. So we, you know, we have a lot of data. We've done a lot of behavioral characterization and so on, but our histology on, on um, what we think are metastases to the lungs, the kidneys, we think, you know, we've seen some lesions on the brain, but we can't say that these are confirmed tumors and um, assess the pleiotropy of this model until we get that data back. So it's um, definitely been challenging to write a manuscript with partial data, kind of anticipating what you think the data is going to say, but not having it in hand. You know, you always want to be careful doing that. So it's um, it's frustrating. And as far as the animals, you know, um, 
they're, they're still alive. They're still in their cages. They're still developing tumors. We have to, if we get an email that a tumor has developed, we have to go in and take care of that animal, you know, and, and we don't want to lose the data. So someone has to go in and, and take care of that. So also coordinating that effort is just, um, it, it's just another thing on our list that we're, we're having to take care of right now. Um, I guess the, the other thing I just wanted to, to ask, um, maybe you have some insight into this. You talked to, about you've made these patient-specific mutations. Obviously, um, UAB, um, University of Alabama uh, in Birmingham is, is, is a very large uh, center um, for uh, NF uh, research. Um, is, is everything still happening kind of normal there? Or, or are patients still able to come in and get the treatment they need? Or, um, or do you get a sense that the community are kind of scared to come, in, to come into the clinic? We've definitely seen um, reports of just a, a total reduction in emergency room cases. And so, you know, things like strokes, heart attacks, um, and so on, you know, those, those things aren't stopping because COVID has happened, but the number of people going into the emergency room has dropped. So there, there's definitely a fear that you know, people are scared to go in because they're worried about uh, getting another infection while they're in the hospital for something else. Um, and um, all elective procedures were canceled for um, the entire month of April. And thinking about that from the point of view as a health system, you know, that's a giant hit on income for us um, because the clinics are, are, you know, the major source of, of our income and, and some of that money comes over to support the research mission that we're doing. Um, so we're, we're losing that as well. Um, as of this Friday, elective procedures are now going to be allowed again. So hopefully um, people will start being a little more comfortable going to see their doctors. Um, I know I got a call that I can finally take my daughter um, back to the orthopedist uh, to take a look at her hip because that, that was canceled. So um, things are slowly opening back up. Hopefully people will um, heed the advice being given by the experts out there and wear their PPE and, um, you know, we'll keep, um, keep the curve down. Yeah, that's going to be really critical to make sure to avoid the second wave as Kevin and you guys were chatting about. Yeah. We uh, actually have a question from Jane. Uh, she asks, I'm curious if they use sophisticated caging for the animals, such as those done by ten, ten, tenioplast. It might make a difference if we shut down again. Um, look, at, is that question in the chat? I believe I was sent directly to our... Um, oh, okay. Um, as of right now, we are just using standard uh, ventilated cages. We're not using any type of sophisticated monitoring. Um, we just have our animal care staff that's going in and um, checking on our animals for us. Okay, cool. Looks like uh, we have some questions from the audience that were sent in before we started uh, today. So um, looks like one of these here uh, was asking about using the use of animal models versus organoids. Um, I guess based on, uh, they're asking some genetically inherited conditions don't show disease phenotypes in animal models. Um, when validating genome editing approaches to rescue specific disease causing mutations, um, do you, you know, would you employ either animal models or organoids? Lauren, do you want to touch on that a bit? Definitely. That's a, that's a great question and something that we think about a lot. We, um, let me move this window. So I will say that we, um, our lab, uh, personally, we validate our genome editing approaches for uh, gene therapy in vitro before moving in vivo. And we're not specifically using organoids currently. Um, Bob Kesterson was supposed to go on sabbatical to learn how uh, more about growing the organoids the second half of this year. Obviously, that's been pushed back now. But we do have um, like human iPSC, some of them generated by Synthico, um, some of them 
um, done in house. We have ES cells that we work with, and um, we are we use that more for assessing specificity and kind of comparing guide to guide. And then when we're ready to look at actual delivery and um, safety concerns, then we want to move forward into our in vivo system. So I would kind of um, maybe cheat a little bit and say both. Um, when we're validating, when we're in the validation stage, we're definitely doing that in vitro first. Okay, cool. We actually have a question from Sally in the audience. How is your efficiency with uh, CPF1 versus Cas9? Um, well, it's a little difficult to answer that question because we have only had one project so far that we needed to use CPF1, um, but we did produce that mouse in one day of injection. So, um, I, I have, um, I'm very comfortable if I need to switch to CPF1, but Cas9 is still my workhorse. As far as efficiency though, um, the efficiency was great. I don't have, you know, a larger end that I could compare them directly to each other, but um, I, I um, definitely appreciated the ability to switch over to CPF1 and would recommend using it in protein form. So you can buy the purified protein now just like Cas9. Uh, looks like we have another question uh, that came through at the beginning. What's the better way to deal with COVID-19? Letting herd immunity develop versus blocking transmission and exposure with extensive testing and quarantine? Lori, yeah. do you want to tackle this one? Or I guess I, maybe I can say something about it first. Maybe yeah, go ahead, tell, yeah. tell me if you think I'm off base. Um, I mean, I, you know, I think the concept of herd immunity is, is something that... Um, is really important, but it really depends on the ability of a community to um, basically very rapidly um, develop immunity. So either as an example, like uh, with influenza, with flu. So typically many of us get a flu vaccine. I hope you're all getting your flu shots. Um, and uh, when, you ha when you do that, then you're helping to build up herd immunity really rapidly, right, in a community. Um, and then, so transmission to uh, members of the community who are more susceptible um, to getting the disease much worse than, than other people, um, than a, a lot of us who are healthy, um, then that becomes less of an issue for them. Um, so I think in the condition that we're going through right now um, with SARS-CoV-2, obviously this is a highly contagious, as we've seen, a highly contagious virus that literally has gone across the globe, like on this world tour without anything stopping it. Um, and so really there isn't a chance for us to build up herd immunity really quickly. Um, so, you know, for me, I think the most important thing is actually blocking transmission and limiting exposure and being able to test everybody. I mean, I think the ideal situation would be that you can test everybody in a population and then you can figure out which focal point, which areas have like high degrees of, of infection and then maybe try to, try to, uh, keep them isolated in some way. What, what do you think, Laura? I absolutely agree. I think, um, especially right now, with there being questions about um, whether there really can be immunity or how long the immunity can be sustained, I think um, blocking the transmission and doing testing, not just for the virus, but also for the antibodies. Um, it looks like there's a promising therapy um, coming with um, using plasma from people who have previously been infected. Um, so I think um, that and just, you know, everyone being willing, willing to follow the quarantine guidelines. I know it gets tiring. I'm tired of it, but uh, just, just listening to what they're saying. And um, also want to add the disclaimer that I am not a physician. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> um, it looks like we have a, um, a down the, the bottom of the screen here, you can see we also have a, a link to a, a web page we have at Synthigo that has some uh, interesting resources for people who are uh, looking to either to learn about um, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, but more specifically some research responses um, that we've had internally at Synthigo and, and the research we're looking um, from other groups as well um, uh, as we go through this. Um, do we have any more questions, Aditya, from the audience? 
Okay. Yeah, we, we have one last one. Uh, Sally from the EPA agency. As a postdoc, what can I do to make sure my research progresses during this time? Kevin, did you want to take that? Or? I'll, I'll, uh, you're closer to the postdoc world than I am these days. <laughs> so I'll let you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, of course, a lot of that's going to depend on on your field and, and what you have going on. But I will say at UAB, we've been, um, we've been able to ask for special permission to continue projects that um, either, you know, stopping now, just stopping cold would result in a catastrophic loss of data or if it's required, you know, if, it, if there's a student working toward a thesis or dissertation, you know, you can get special permission to do that. So um, my advice would be, you know, write up your essential experiments that you need to do and, and take it to your leadership and, um, you know, make the argument that this needs to progress during this time. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really great point. Um, you know, I mean, honestly, it's, um, it's all about, you know, prioritizing work and hopefully everyone's PI and everyone's boss can understand that like during this time, you know, it's for a lot of us, it's like sabbatical and, but there are other things that we can all be doing, as you mentioned earlier, uh, whether it's manuscript writing, um, planning new experiments, or maybe even just ordering uh, supplies so you can get ready if, if it's possible to get those. So um, yeah, those are really good points. Um, I guess maybe next, uh, Laura, maybe just some uh, final thoughts as, as we look back at this model again, um, just kind of thinking about how now we maybe go into this transition phase and um, the institutions um, such as UAB, um, they're, they're going to open up, right, it said. So, um, you know, will it be pretty soon that you'll be going in, in into the lab again or um, do you think it's going to be a little further and, and how do you think that looks like? I, I have the sense that we'll be somewhat back open before the end of May here in Birmingham. I don't think we have been hit quite as hard as some other places in the country. Um, and so we're going to cautiously try to reopen. And I think, you know, we all just need to keep in mind that this is truly unprecedented and to take care of yourself, um, take care of your mental health, try to be understanding with others and be understanding of, of what you're going through. You know, no one has ever dealt with this before. So we don't know the best way to deal with it. And just, um, yeah, just take it, take it easy on yourself. And um, as, as we try to open back up. What does the, what does the new normal look for you? If you have any idea of what that might, you could imagine. Definitely face masks. So um, Birmingham now has a mandate that outside of your home or your vehicle, you are required to wear a face mask at all times, or you can uh, face a, a penalty, a, a fine. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's hard to imagine it and, and a little upsetting to think about um, trying to Sorry, I get a little emotional thinking about trying to make a child size mask for my little boy to go to daycare. You know, the new normal is, uh, it's going to be really different for us. As, as far as at work, um, I, I have a lot of faith in our group. You know, we're really, really strong um, research group, no issues there, but um, just trying to keep everyone safe and, and, um, you know, be more flexible. I think we'll definitely be working from home and more and doing more Zoom meetings than we were previously. So maybe some, you know, people complain or joke, you know, this meeting could have been an email. Maybe more of those will become emails. Um, so we'll, we'll see how that happens. Yeah, I know that's a, it's a really good point. I think uh, supporting one another and being more understanding and empathetic. Uh, those are all things that we definitely are practicing it since the go and we definitely mental health is a bigger issue than I think most people realize. I definitely feel that way at times. I don't know if you heard the zoom fatigue, but that's definitely <laughs> a thing that happens. <laughs> um, so, but with that, as we're wrapping up our, um, our CRISPR office hours here today, I want to give a moment and ask Kevin, um, who's going to be joining us next week. 
Yeah, so um, it looks like uh, next week we're going to be having uh, Imran House join us. He's a postdoc uh, researcher in cancer immunology at the Peter Mac Cancer Center in Melbourne, Australia. So he's going to be giving us a, uh, the down under perspective um, on how the shutdown has been affecting uh, life and research in Australia as well. And also, I think he's got a pretty cool story about um, he was actually over in California doing some work um, at Stanford as a, um, as a visiting research fellow, uh, then had to zip over to New York and I think uh, just kind of got back um, into Australia in time before they uh, shut down their, uh, that country as well. So um, yeah, it should be a pretty exciting chat with Imran um, as well next week. So um, uh, anyway, uh, Deetra, can you remind the audience also how they can get one of the Keep Calm and CRISPR on t-shirts? Of course. Um, you can go to synthego.com slash com and claim your Keep Calm and CRISPR on t-shirt. Um, we want to say thank you, uh, Laura, for joining us today. Uh, it was really great and understanding a different perspective on cores as well as how that impacts universities. And also, as always, thanks, Kevin. Never a dull moment hosting with you. Thanks. It's been a, a real pleasure to be here with you today again, uh, Aditya. And uh, Laura, thank you so much for joining us and for giving um, uh, some information about what you've been doing and sharing some of your insights. Absolutely. Um, uh, thank you guys for having me on. And um, if anyone wants to reach me directly, you know, feel free to share my contact information. Okay, great. All right. So uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, goodbye. And we will see you next week uh, for uh, the next episode of CRISPR Office Hours. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.